Welcome to Aiken This Week. I'm Emory Langston. Today I'm being joined by members of Aiken Public Safety. We're going to be talking about animal control. I'm being joined by Lieutenant Carl Odenthal, Public, um, Public Safety Officer Alan Willing, and Environmental Control Officer Chris Weathersby. And um, thank you all so much for being here today. We're very glad to have you talk about a very important subject that I know that you all get lots of questions about all the time. Um, but first, to get started, let's hear from each of you as to what your role is and uh, what you do with um, public safety and specifically the Animal Control Division. Well, I, I'm Lieutenant Carl Odenthal. I've been with the city for about 25 years and I supervise animal control and work with, work with them hand in hand in the day-to-day -day solving of animal control issues. I'm Alan Willing, uh, work with public safety been with public safety since uh, 07, about eight years. I uh, switched over to animal control probably about two years ago. And I'm Environmental Control Officer Weathersby. I've been doing this for about five years. Came from Richmond County doing animal control over there, and I'm new to the city of Aiken as Environmental Control Officer. Very good, very good. Well, again, thank you all for being here today. I know that with, with animal control, we work with um, several entities across our community um, dealing with animal issues. Um, can y'all talk about that a little bit, about our partnership um, with our different organizations and, and who our main partner is and, and how that works? Okay. Um, we deal with many different agencies throughout the, the city and county area. Uh, we work with county animal control. Uh, because there are a lot of donut holes, so-called, to where the streets, one side of the street may be city, one side of the street may be county. So we work hand in hand with them. Uh, we work with SPCA. Uh, we're contracted with them for, that's where all of our strays go to. Uh, we deal with DHEC on dog bite cases, cat scratch cases, anything like that. So we have many different agencies throughout the, the city that we do work hand in hand with, um, just, you know, depending on the situation or what, what the call actually calls for. And I'm sure we'll, t we'll talk a little bit more about our partners as we go through our discussion today, but there is a distinction between um, who, the, who, our, who the city entity who we work with as far as um, a lead partner and then who the county works with. Is that correct? That is correct. The county has their own shelter that is funded through the county. All their funds come through the county. They have volunteer organizations work with them. With us, we're, we rent space per se through the SPCA. We contract, they take all of our strays and work with us on our spay and neutering through their surgical clinic and all. So that's how the difference between, so it depends on the location of where the animal comes sure. from as to what, what building it may be at. Uh, they're actually in two separate locations. The county is located on Wire Road, and the SPCA is located on Willow Run Road. And they're very close into proximity. Very, very close. So I'm sure that sometimes that offers itself for a little bit of confusion. It does, and sometimes we get calls, both agencies will get calls as to where a stray may have come from or where it may have been picked up. If you've lost your animal and you're looking for it, check in both places. Right, sure, sure. Well, I know this division stays very busy um, to ensure that y'all that, that good information is getting out to our citizens um, to be responsible pet owners, um, getting that education out. Um, so I know what, what we do with injured animals. So I think that a question that y'all would probably get a whole bunch was, um, what do I do if I see a stray dog or a stray cat? You can contact Aiken Public Safety uh, or you could contact the SPCA. Either way, you can use phone or email and they'll get in contact with Animal Control if they're on duty. If not, they'll send a public safety officer out there and we'll go out to follow up. Okay. All right. Very good. So um, what should, another question that I think would probably come to the forefront of, of your mind is, what do I do if there is an unwanted animal? Whether it's, um, unfortunately, I you know sometimes there has to be a surrender of animals, 
or there's an animal in my neighborhood that nobody seems to claim and it's kind of an unwanted um, situation. What do city residents do in that type of situation? Well, I think the, one of the first things to do is say what we don't want you to do. Okay. And what we don't want you to do is just if you have an animal that you don't want anymore, don't just throw it out. We've had some cases where people have just tossed them out of cars or, or leave them at some front of somebody else's door or just release them. I mean, that's, that's, for us, that's the worst thing you could do. Sure. Uh, the best thing to do is go ahead and same thing. If you have a, you could surrender that animal um, at the SPCA, you could contact us or, you know, we'll, or first off, try to find someone else to a good home for the animal um, and use us as the last resort on that. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add to that? No, anyway? that's, that's it. You can, or depending on what location you may live in, mm -hmm. um, whatever your closest humane, sh sh humane shelter is to, you know, find it a good home. Right. Uh, don't, don't just leave it abandoned somewhere having to struggle for food. You know, we, we have places, you know, call either public safety, animal control for the county or SPCA. And I'm sure that they can... Um, direct folks as to exactly what needs to happen. Yes. Okay, so once an animal is picked up, what happens to that animal? Once it's picked up, it's taken to the SPCA, and from there it goes to one of the locations in there, whether it's a cat or whether it's a dog. And then if we have a microchip on it or we have any further information, we can get in contact with the owner or we can look through different resources to try to locate the owner. And if not, then it's possible to go for adoption after it's spayed and neutered. Mm -hmm. You mentioned microchipping, and I know that this is not something that, that we, we were, um, had, had talked about. Um, but can you talk about, about the microchipping? Is that a service that is offered at the animal shelter or at the SPCA? Microchipping is done, can be done at SPCA. A lot of local vets do do that okay. also, but it is something that has to be registered once you do put that microchip in, so it comes back to that specific owner and not relies as unregistered, so we can't look at the owner. Sure. And the updating it, a lot of times people will change an address or a phone number and forget to update the microchip number information, so that's where we run into a lot of times mm -hmm. of we can't find the owner is because they have either moved or changed phone services and did not update that information. So mm -hmm. now you have a family member at the shelter that's looking for home and we can't get it back. And, and the, uh, the microchip just gives us an information of where to look in the computer. Exactly. So it's, it's just giving us a number to right. check. So Right. So yep. well, it's a good thing. You right. just have to remember to to keep up exactly. with that information. The, the other thing I want to mention too, Emery, if we have time, is, is, sure. is when we bring the animals in, we do an evaluation on the animal to see whether or not it is a, adoptable. You know, if it's a, a violent animal or has violent tendencies, we, we obviously want to make sure it's going to be safe in someone's home that adopts it. Mm -hmm. So there is an evaluation process that we work hand in hand with the, uh, our partners at the SPCA with to, to evaluate the animal for a certain amount of time before we uh, turn it over to them to put on the floor. Sure. Well, I, I know the city does some trapping. So, does the city trap, do, is there a city program to, to trap certain animals, to trap cats in the neighborhood? We do trap cats, um, and the problem with, we have limited number of traps and a lot of citizens, so that is what, you get put on a list and depending how long the list is at the time. Sometimes it may be a couple of days, sometimes it may go into a couple of weeks mm -hmm. uh, because we do trap for the whole city. So like I said, with the number of traps and the number of people in the city, sometimes it can be a little lengthy and that's where we ask, you know, to, to please, you know, just be patient. We, you are on the list okay. and we will get to you. It's just, it may take us a little bit before we get to you. Uh, we do have regulations set for the trapping, we don't set the traps less than 40 degrees outside mm -hmm. and when the temperatures reach above 100. Mm. So within that range we will trap, but we also take care of the well-being for the, the animal of if it's 30 degrees outside, we don't want it in a trap all night till we come back and check the trap. Sure. So we, we do regulate it with that. We're coming up some of that, you know, with the winter months, mm -hmm. so, so that's going to kind of damper some of our trapping. But still, we do have uh, dog traps also. Mm -hmm. If we cannot catch the dog 
we can set traps if it, you know, depending on the location. We prefer to have kind of where the dog comes back to where it feels comfortable when we set the trap because that's where it's going to hang around it. Mm -hmm. um, if people see one just stroll through their yard and don't see it again, there's not much need to set a trap there. He's just passing through. So it's as much information that somebody can give us as far as where dog stays, where they see it hanging out mostly in the times. That actually helps narrow down as to when we can get it picked up. Right. So with, with domesticated animals, I guess, your cats and dogs, what about um, animals that are not domesticated, raccoons, possums, things like that? Wildlife, we prefer to send back to either a private contractor or pest control. Okay. Uh, we deal with the domesticated. Now, we have come across some situations where people set their own traps and we'll catch raccoons and possums, mm -hmm. and you can call public safety for that. We do pick those traps up, uh, but we specifically would rather keep the wildlife, you know, more towards the private contractors and, and pesticide people uh, a can pest control or some places, you know, that do sure. nuisance animals removal versus we stay more to the domesticated side. Sure, absolutely. Well, let's talk for a minute about vaccinations because that is so very important um, with our with our furry friends. Um, so, what does do dogs have to have proof of vaccination? Yes, ma'am. Dogs and cats both have to have proof of rabies vaccination, mm -hmm. and that can either be done yearly or they can have a three-year vaccination, mm -hmm. but it has to be done by a licensed vet, and they have to keep that proof on them at all times, and preferably for them to have the rabies tag on their collar, mm -hmm. and that needs to be brought in with the registration also if it's turned okay. in with the, done through the SPCA or records. Okay. Well, so what happens if my dog or cat bites somebody? That's probably, is that a big question? I mean, do you get that one a lot? Well, we deal with DHEC on that. We'll, we're going to come out, we're going to do an incident report. Um, whether your dog bites a human or whether it bites another domesticated animal, mm -hmm. we still want to do an incident report on it for documentation purposes, as well as if it's made human contact, we carry the, that incident report to DHEC. Um, if it's wildlife, DHEC will test it for rabies. If it's current on rabies and has the shots and everything, then they're gonna put a 10 day quarantine hold on it, which, you know, that just is a monitoring process mm -hmm. for whether anything happens to the bite or anything different happens to the animal. Um, and the people, you know, still can get what med the medical condition conditions are needed, taken care of, the bites looked at, the scratch looked at, monitored and all that, that's all that 10 day process is. Sure. sure. So if um, a dog or a cat bites somebody, somebody calls in, files that report with um, public safety, then that information, so y'all work in concert with the state on, on an issue like that yes, um, because of the, the, the potential of rabies. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And a lot of times that'll happen through, we'll get a call where someone's down at the hospital, they have a bite, they're getting shots okay. or whatever. And that's a lot of times they don't even contact us. We will we'll be contacted through the hospital sure. while someone's being treated for the injury. Sure. Uh, cat scratches, are they treated just like cat bites? Yes. Anything that breaks the skin, whether it's a bite or a scratch, we would rather err on the side of caution for staying, you know, watching it, monitoring it, see what happens to the injury, as well as if we can get our hands on the cat, watching the cat while it's in the quarantine hold. And I'm sure that probably when, when you're dealing with bites and, and you're talking about the quarantine process, um, that folks have animals that are strictly outside, they have animals that are indoor, outdoor, and then they have animals that are, that are inside. And even if it's a situation where it's a, an inside animal, you know, for the most part, we have to follow those guidelines because those are state regulations. Yes, those are state regulated through DHEC, yes ma'am. So Chris, you, you alluded to a registration process that, yes, that animals have to be registered. So, so let's talk about that a little bit and how that works with the city. All right, Your, um, any animal that you have, dog or cat, needs to be registered through either records at Public Safety Headquarters or through the SPCA mm -hmm. and that information gets to us. 
That way we will be able to know, you know, how many dogs are at the property, who owns them, and that, that helps everyone that way. If the animal's lost, we have a description of it, or it's microchipped, we have a way to contact the owner and get the animal back to where it belongs. But it also keeps regulations on the animals that are in our city. We make sure we don't have any animals that are not needed there or unregistered there. Okay, and so what happens if an animal is unregistered? If the animal is unregistered, they can either be fined for that, mm -hmm. or the best thing to do is if your animal is unregistered, you're new to the area, contact the SPCA or contact public safety and find out what needs to be done in the steps for that to obtain it and what other laws are needed. To make sure that, yes, that all our furry friends have the documentation that they need. Exactly. Um, and that is cats and dogs. Cats and dogs. Both. Okay. Memory, if I could add as sure. well, um, we do receive a lot of questions from the city's website. So you could actually type in your question there and they will make sure it gets forwarded to us to answer and we'll have someone get back in contact with that person as soon as we can. Very good. Very good. All right, so we've, we've talked about vaccinations and we've talked about registration um, and something that I think is very important for the, the health of our, our um, pets is um, spay and neuter. Do, do, do pets have to be, do dogs and cats have to be spayed or neutered? The spay and neutering we leave up to the, the individual owner. Um, we would prefer that it be spayed or neutered. Mm -hmm. The city registration is based off of, that is one of the fee differences in there, whether or not the animal is spayed or neutered, and as well as whether it's microchipped or not. So there's many different prices for the registration and that's what it's all based off of is if you actually have it registered, it's spayed or neutered, um, it's a one-time fee. Basically when it gets down to everything's taken care of like that, it's almost a, a free registration. Mm -hmm. With all your information in it, you get a number. We can ch check that number through our records if the animal gets off of your property for whatever reason, we can get it back to you as well. I mean, we basically have two things, the microchip as well as the city registration. So spay and neutering is something we do recognize and kind of promote uh, because it does help any unwanted animals beside the roadways and all if it does get out. So we do kind of, you know, push for having spay and neuter. We can't force you to but you will pay a difference in price on the registration. And, and if I could, Emery, the, uh, one of the interesting things when we were talking about some of these topics at a, a recent neighborhood meeting, uh, there was a lot of Aiken residents that didn't realize they had to register their, mm -hmm. their, uh, their animals. And uh, as far as the uh, spay or neutering, um, we especially want to emphasize that for cats because they, they have a tendency to be outside and go a little bit further and wander from their property in a lot of cases. Now some house cats obviously aren't gonna be doing that, um, but they do that more so than dogs. And so uh, we're seeing an increase in the cat population right now. I was just talking to one of the members from the SPCA and she said we've got a lot of cats in right now. Mm -hmm. And if uh, this would help us control the, the, uh, the population out there, if, if we could just have residents spay or neuter their, their animal. Well, and getting that word out, I know, is important and part of the education process that, that y'all like to promote in the division. And I'm sure that um, if the opportunity presented itself, because, Carl, you just said at a neighborhood meeting, if there were other neighborhood meetings going on or anything like that, that um, any one of you gentlemen would be glad to, to attend a meeting to, to help get the word out about the right. spay and neuter program. Answer those questions. We'll, we'll do a presentation if they, if they have time for that or are willing to do that. We, any way we could get the word out would be, be beneficial. Very good, very good. Well, let's talk now about um, the city's leash law. And when we are having our, our pets out, walking, um, enjoying the downtown or just in our backyards, um, if y'all could talk a little bit about what, that's, what the city's leash law is. Any animal that is in the city vacant has, or the state of South Carolina is a state law. It's a state law. The animals have to be restrained by some sort of means, whether that means if it's on your property, it has to be in a fenced in area, things like that. If it's off the property, it has to be on a leash. The only exception is the service animal though. So basically if you're walking your dog down the street, you're jogging with it, it has to be on a leash, it has to be under your control at all times. And that just helps everyone. No one wants, you know, 
they're jogging and their dog takes off chasing a squirrel. Right. Or also, you know, at the Odell Weeks, no one wants to be passing a dog and the dog chases after them or anything like that. So it's a preventive measure. Very good. Very good. Now that is <clears throat> that is an instance where we've uh, we've actually made charges where um, someone has failed to restrain their animal and. Um, so it ends up a child getting bit, some kid riding his bike by, and the dog chases it. I mean, some, you just have to have control of your animal, and sometimes that, that really helps out, just having that leash. Right. Um, well, when, when it comes to some kind of the more unusual uh, animals that, that we can see in our city from time to time, armadillos and bats. And I know that the armadillos, the armadillo population seems to be making its way into our area. It is. Can you all talk about the, both of those um, animals? Well, those are surprisingly some calls that we do get in our dispatch. Uh, some will claim they have a bat, bats in their attic and they're, they're wanting us to come out and get it. Or same thing, armadillos, I don't, I don't know a whole lot about them, but evidently they can really mess up somebody's yard. <laughs> so, so when that starts happening, uh, uh, people are, have been calling us. and. And I'll def defer to Alan on this one. With, you know, like Lieutenant was saying, the bats, there again, we go back to a contractor or a mm -hmm. nuisance removal. Uh, we do not come inside of your residence to remove bats and stuff from the attic. And with armadillos, they are coming into this area more and more. And what you're starting to see, an armadillo will find mostly like up under shrubbery, bushes, mm -hmm. hedges type and dig a hole and make its, its den. Um, they will come out, they look for grubs, worms and stuff, and that's what a lot of people with grasses, they'll come out and see where something's flipped the grass up. That's what he's doing was going looking for varmints up under the grass. But we do not deal with the armadillos because there again, that's kind of the wildlife. Mm -hmm. So we're staying away from those. Uh, with the traps that we have, we, it's a little bit harder to catch them in our traps that we use, so that would be another line of traps that we have to have mm -hmm. for the armadillos. So we just, we've tried to, to stay away from the wildlife with that. But you can still call for, you know, the pesticide, pest control peoples, right. or your nuisance wildlife removal animals right. uh, for that, that type call, well, rather than public safety. I think that that's very important to educate people about is that um, you, to, to the proper people to call mm -hmm. and for, for what you need it so and that y'all do not enter homes to no, get, get uh, nuisance animals out and, and so those bats <laughs> can <laughs> cause problems and um, so we would need to call a specialized company like yes. Aiken Pest Control or somebody like that. Well, I know that the um, SPCA has, um, working in conjunction with public safety, has a very uh, interesting program um, that's fairly new from what I understand. It's the TNR program, is that correct? That's it. Can you tell, can you ta tell us what TNR stands for and kind of talk about that program? TNR has been around for a while across the country. It's actually stands for trap neuter return um, basically deals with community cats and a community cat is a cat that maybe all the neighbors feed or just lives around a dumpster does not really have a home but still does some good in the community as far as taking care of rodents um, squirrels which are all over the city so what we do, a lot of our calls will come in for a nuisance cat. We will trap the cat, we carry it to the SPCA, and it either gets spayed or neutered, and then return back to the area. The studies have shown that when you pull a cat out of a community colony, the, another stray will move in, and who knows what he brings back, whether it's a disease or whether he is fertile and can, you know, do more breeding and the colony grows even more. As long as you put that one cat back in, a group of cats will keep a stray out. They only want what are their family members, what they trust. Um, so they will keep others away from there. So if you 
if you've got 10 community cats, you're not going to grow into 20 community cats. Once you go through the TNR program, they all get fixed. You can keep your, your 10 cats. Uh, you can take care of them. You can feed them. They live right there in the community area, just like they always have. Uh, but you don't worry about the two, three o'clock calls of the cat fighting, um, one coming in heat and causing the fights at that time of the morning, which is where a lot of our calls were coming in from, from those type situations of beside bedroom windows when somebody's trying to sleep and you got what sounds like a child's out there screaming where cats are fighting. So with that program, uh, we partnered with the SPCA. They do the surgeries. We bring them in with the traps. Uh, they do the surgeries and then we return them back to the areas. And so far we've had nothing but positive feedback. Very good. The one thing that a lot of people don't, we tip the ear and that just lets us know that that cat has been spayed or neutered. Mm -hmm. If it gets back in the trap, we don't have to go back through the whole process of carrying it into surgery, getting it ready for surgery and then find out it's already been taken care of. So that's the only difference you would see. And there are a lot of neighborhood and community leaders around here that take care of TNR cats. Um, so it's, it's actually helped. I mean, as far as what our calls have come into, what we've received of our calls as far as complaints and helping the cat community itself. That was, nationally, it's been a program that's been going yes. on for a number of years, but in our community, it's a fairly new program. It is. It is. Uh, we actually, when we were looking into it, we got with uh, Columbia, um, has been doing it. Spartanburg is a very, very big um, user of it. And Spartanburg, within about two years, their call volumes have dropped drastically for, for their complaints on cats. And they've had all kind of programs that came in to help build, um, like Boy Scout groups have come in and built community colony cat houses uh, for certain areas. So you've actually had other organizations throughout your city that come together and help. It's not just, you know, animal control right. or just, you know, the TNR program. It's, it's helped, you know, reach out for all over the place. Some good outreach. Well, we have, y'all have shared so much good information with us today. Have we forgotten anything? Is there anything else that we want to touch I do want to mention one thing that, uh, if you could, I know we're thinking about doing a show on it later, but uh, February is spay and neuter month, and we're going to partner with the SBCA, and uh, we're going to do a, a clinic, probably going to host it at the SBCA, and, uh, you know, just to, to help people register and, and spay and neuter their animals, just, a, a, just a, an awareness and a, a push towards that, to provide those opportunities for people to come do it. Sure, absolutely. Well, thank you all so much for being here and sharing some information with us today. I hope that all of you have enjoyed, and if you have any specific questions regarding animal control, you can reach out to Public Safety. Thanks so much for being here, and we'll see you next time for Aiken This Week.